John chapter 4. And then we're going to go to Romans chapter 8. 1 John chapter 4. Romans chapter 8. We are less than a month from Muscle Car Sunday. That means for this church, uh, a lot of preparation needed to reach a lot of people. I went Friday night to a car show, rode my scooter over my cars back in the shop getting ready for the car show. So uh, if you've got a hot rod, we'd love for you to bring it out and be a part of what we're going to be doing on Muscle Car Sunday. There'll be sign-up sheets, already some sign-up sheets in the back for you to uh, look at. Go ahead and get your name down. We're going to need nursery help and children's church and a few things like that. And then we'll be adding some sign-up sheets as the month goes on. But uh, many of you, who, is, who in here, first off, has been to a Muscle Car Sunday? Then you know what I'm talking about. And you know the preparation that is going to take place. We're going to feed everybody free barbecue. Uh, there's going to be a, something for everybody to do. But it takes about four or 500 people to pull off what we're going to do. That means everybody's got to be friendly. Yeah, you've got to step up. Amen. Miss Diana, good to have you back. Miss Diane Spurlock, good to have you back from Colorado. We've been keeping our eye on you. Amen. Heard you flipped a vehicle while you were there. We're praying for you. Uh, I, I'm going to Colorado in a, in a week or so. I'm putting bigger tires on my truck for a go. You're the reason. First John chapter 4, are you comfortable? This top headline is so important to our lives. Jesus came to show us the Father. There were such misconceptions throughout the Old Testament that God was some mean, bad, uh, father that would strike you down and beat you up and send snakes and disease and this and that and the other that they missed who the father was and this this bothers me even today if you're a parent or grandparent or guardian you will know that there are times in your life that you are very very good to certain children or grandkids and they, even though you're good to them they perceive it almost as hate though they want something from your hand you follow me? Yeah. Amen. I, and look, if you got little kids, you don't understand it yet. But as they get older, some kids will twist off just a little bit. And all of a sudden, the hand that's been providing for them, they'll start snapping back at it. And I look at Scripture and realize that this is exactly what the children of Israel were doing toward God. They looked at God as this mean Father that was up in heaven that created them. And, and, and many of us have that perception in life. I know when I was a young man, I thought I was scared of God. Oh, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand Scripture. All I knew is if I messed up, then God would whoop me. Because right. my daddy would. Right. So, y'all quiet. Why y'all so quiet? Because y'all didn't get enough sleep. <laughs> y'all, any of y'all ever thought that way? But then I started discovering who God really was. And I did it through the man Christ Jesus. That when Jesus showed up, he came to show us. And we've already talked about this one word, love. And how much love is so important. First John, John is a, a disciple that ran with Jesus. He is John the beloved. He's the one who was always with Jesus. You know who I'm talking about. Loved him so much. John said in chapter 4, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And whoever does not love does not know God, because God is... Love. Say it with me. God is... Love. So he said, listen, guys, you missed it. My daddy is love. You, you, didn't, you missed out on He's provided for you. He's loved you. He's looked out you. Yeah, he spanked you, but he needed to. Because without discipline, he doesn't show you that he really loves you. If he doesn't give you a boundary, he doesn't show you that he really loves you. Then we go into Romans, and Paul says in Romans 8, 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword... As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, or things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the God's love was in Jesus. And he showed us that. And when you grab hold of Jesus, man, you start loving. I remember the hatred I had in my heart toward my grandparents. Amen. Uh, the, uh, you know, you've known about the bootlegging in my family, but what, maybe what you didn't know was the disavowing of children for, for one man to disavow my dad. He, was, he came up. Amen. My, my grandpa lived a half a mile from me, and I never knew it until I was 16 years old. 
I had a hatred for that man. I had a hatred for my other grandfather who shot and killed my uncle. I had hatred for people. And when I got born again, the thing that shifted it, and I didn't even notice it in the beginning, but all of a sudden this hate was flushed out of my life, and I was flooded with love, and all of a sudden the very men I hated, I felt sorry for. I felt pity for them because they did not get to love and get to know me. They didn't get to hold me as a grandson. They didn't get to know me and my brother and my sister and my family had they only known. Amen. And all of this began to change because love filled my heart. And I found so much, it's so much easier for me to love people than to hate people. Because when I hate them, they got me prisoner. And I don't want to be the prisoner of anyone. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So Jesus came to show us. I'm going to give you one more scripture out of Song of Solomon. And then I'm going to let you sit down. But stay, stay with me just a little bit. Song of Solomon says this in chapter 8, verse 7. Many waters, I'm ahead of you, sis. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers, translated floods, cannot wash it away. If one were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly scorned. Which really means we can't buy love. You can't buy it. You can buy affection from somebody else, but it's temporary. You can't buy love. Love is freely given. Many floods. So I want to preach to you this morning that, that literally that floods can't stop love. And how many know we know a little bit about floods around here? Amen. It can't stop love. Father, I love you. I thank you for the word of God. I ask you to wrap yourself around me. Speak through me as your oracle. I thank you, God, for all the, the, the opportunities in life that you present to us for us to love the unlovable in Jesus' name. And everyone shout. Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, <laughs> say this with me. I get a kick out of serving Jesus. <laughs> and if the devil gets too close, <laughs> he's going to get a kick out of it too. <laughs> Amen. Now you can go ahead and sit down. I, I got to keep y'all awake this morning. I got to keep me awake. Many waters. It says, many waters, many waters cannot quench love. Waters, the word waters here in the Hebrew, and of course you understand the Old Testament is written in Hebrew language, New Testament written in Greek language. That may not mean a lot to you, but the Hebrew language is very colorful. And it says here that many waters, that literally means juice or things that are squeezed or extracted by pressure. Pressure can't take away the love of God in your life. Amen. No matter how much pressure comes, it can't squeeze that out. And then the word flood, things that flow together as a course against you. In life, there will be things that are going to come against you. You're going to feel the pressure. It's going to hit you, and you've got to decide. And Jesus went through the waters and the floods of so many things in life, amen, and particularly at the end of his life. As he moved toward the end, our text to be found in John chapter 13, verse 1, as we're moving toward Easter, moving toward the cross, John 13, 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, everybody remember the Passover out of the book of Exodus, where, they, where the death angel passed over uh, Goshen, where the children of Israel were in captivity there in, in uh, Egypt, and the death angel passed over according to the word of Moses. And they put blood on the doorpost. And it actually signified the first cross. And the death angel passed over. And every firstborn in Egypt died. Everybody in Israel was secure. You don't believe that. Do you? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Now the reason I ask you is this. You have to believe that the blood can protect your family. That when you bleed the blood over your children, God got them. Amen. I pray over my dogs, my horses, my Harleys. I pray over everything. Amen. Amen. I'm pleading the blood, asking Jesus to take care of it because I'm his son. Amen. And as his son, I believe I have a right to do that. Yes. Amen. So John tells us, 13.1, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. The NIV, of course, tells us he showed them the full extent of his love with a footnote that reads, he loved them to the last, the amplified, he loved them to the last and to the highest degree. The message Bible says, having loved his dear companions, he continued to love them right to the end. Uh, Barclay said he decided to show them that his love was like in a way which sent to the ultimate limit. Amen. So here Jesus is walking into this Passover moment, but his biggest thing is, is I love those the Father gave me. The writer pins these words as one 
one who did not hear about the extent of his love, but as one who is a witness to it. John witnessed the love of God. It was the apostle here, the one, the scripture says, the one whom Jesus loved. Who said, who, who said the one whom Jesus loved? He did. Yeah, right. Amen. He was all about himself, just a little bit, just like some of, never mind. <laughs> From this perspective, he tells us, what went on in that room of destiny? That room where the disciples gathered, where Jesus was with them during Passover, what took place? He gave us a, a view, if you would, inside of the expression of Christ and how much love that he had for them. There was such a place there that the floods had hit. It was festivity. Amen. There were friendships that were going to go sideways. What a vast theme love is. When you speak on the subject of love, in the essence of deity, Jesus, God himself, must consider its spontaneity, its lack of prejudice. When you mentioned the woman at the well, there was no prejudice there. When you look at race, there was no prejudice there. When you look at economic development, there was no prejudice there. Love just loves. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. It looks at that, and that's what God does. It's portrayed in 1 Corinthians. That 1 Corinthians is the greatest of the trinity of godly virtues. The scripture now, says, now abide faith, hope, and love. Lays them out. But then it lays into this one word, the greatest of these is love. It's good to have faith. It's good for all of us to have hope for tomorrow. But if you ain't got love, you ain't got nothing. Amen. you got to have love. So the flood first was this tradition that Passover comes. We have traditions, don't we? Birthday traditions. We have traditions of Christmas and Thanksgiving. And some even celebrate such lurid holidays as Halloween. Oh, man, don't touch that, Pastor. Okay. St. Patty's Day. If you ever see me wear green on St. Patty's Day, pinch me. Because I'm not acting right. Because I don't, I just don't, there's certain traditions that don't mean much to me. Amen. I don't flow, I'm not Irish, so it doesn't mean that much. Amen. But these, these traditions, the traditions are as good as long as they reflect a reality. Let me say it again. I celebrate Christmas because it reflects a reality. I give God thanks for Thanksgiving because it reflects a reality. You've got to look for where it reflects the reality. Is this a good thing? The greatest day of celebration to the Jewish race was Passover, a time of festivity, of joy. It reflected on the day that the angel of death passed over. Amen. Because of the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. It brought families together. Everybody together. Holidays are always the days of distractions for us. When I hit the holidays, I'm hitting 10 extra pounds. Uh -huh, you are too. I watch you. You, you go through this. It, it, it's distracting. We miss out on church a lot of times. We gather family in. Things come in. It's frustrating. It's, uh, <laughs> there are certain movies that depict uh, what, I, what I see as, as holidays. One of my favorite movies, and I shouldn't get on this, is Christmas Vacation. But I think of all the chaos that happens when families get together and the distraction that takes away the love of God in your life. And would this be an extraction for Jesus? But no, he used this day to represent his servanthood. He continued to love them. Though there was a flood of activities all around him and people scurrying, Jesus' mind was on one thing, showing the disciples how much he loved them. How much that no matter what's fixing to happen in the next 24 to 48 hours, I love you guys. I want you to know that. I've walked with you for three years, but I'm not fixing to walk away from you. The next flood that hit was this term his hour he used this phrase amen jesus knew that his hour had come the reality that the end had come chapter 12 verse 23 tells us and jesus answered them saying the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified if you study that one those two words his hour if you look at it you'll find there were times they wanted to stone him and kill him Amen. They went after him to take him out. And Jesus slipped through the crowd and he used the phrase, my hour has not come. Everybody say, my hour. Everybody here has an hour. For Kelly Smith, it was 59 years she passed away. Some of your loved ones, I have done their funerals, memorials, and you know that they had an hour. They had a time. They had a season. They had a place in which God put them on planet Earth. Everybody here has an exit date, an extra, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? expiration time in your life when you're going to get out of here. you got to live every day as if it was your last. So Jesus hits his hour and said, my hour has come. Now I say that to you to let you know that right now in the United States and around the world, there is a virus that is, that is rampant on news media. Are you hearing me? And there are people not going to church. There are people not going to, to basketball games. There are people not going on cruises. There are people not getting on planes. They, and here's my thing. I even told my wife last night because she's fixing to get on a plane. And she said, I'm a little bit nervous about that. And I said, listen to me. 
if God wants to take me out with a virus, then God can take me out with a virus. If he wants to take me out with my Harley, he can take me out with a Harley. If he wants to take me out when I jump out of a plane, then the parachute won't open. Because I promise you, I will have one on. I told everybody, you can can jump out of a plane once without a parachute. But you'll never do it twice. What I'm saying to you is this. You can't allow life to shut down because you see something on the news. It was last year was, was uh, 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 one, another virus. I, I just counted my head over the last five years. Swine flu, bird flu, Ebola. Uh, it's just every year there's something. And there's always going to be something. Amen. Until it's a full-blown plague. I, I mean, I just look at it and go, come on, guys. Y'all have nothing to talk about. And I'm not, I'm not demeaning it or putting it down. I know it's already in Houston, but so is the flu. So is cancer. So is diabetes. So is leukemia. So there's so many things that, you know, you, and what I'm telling you, Pastor, you just give me more stuff to worry about. <laughs> Jesus said, don't worry. Don't worry about somebody can take your life. Worry about the one who put your soul in hell. Amen. That's what you ought to be worried about. So when Jesus got close to the end of life, he knew at 33, his life was over. His hour had come. And this flood of all the emotion. And I've often said this, God, just give me a heads up. Let me know about when you think I'm fixing to leave. Just, get, just I don't care, one minute, 10 minutes, 15 would be really good. Amen. But give me a heads up. He knew. He was clearly understanding, amen, that his season was coming to an end. The crucible of his life was going to be over. He knew it would eventually arrive, but now it's here. He faced an event that would divide time and go down in history as something every soul would have to acknowledge. When Jesus died, we started A.D.s and B.C.s. Amen. That's how important his death was. That was the apex of his history. Would face in this frenzy of emotion. Sidetrack him from proving his passion was genuine. He knew he was, and a lot of times, hear me, we are, and it's, and I'm, it's not about being selfish. I think we just want to say the last, some people are selfish, but a lot of us just want to get our, get the words in, say some things. Jesus was totally unselfish at the end of his life. He laid his life down. Even on the cross, we'll find out they didn't take his life. He gave it up. He made sure he stayed in control to the very end and understood what was going on. He loved those disciples, and he loves me and you all the way to the end. How about us? Do the emotions of life and death distract us from the purpose of God in our lives? Are we going to let something that we hear on the news every year, by the way, it's it's every year, or what's going on around the world, stop us from pressing in and serving God? Amen. I'm not not nervous about flying at all. I flew right after 9-11 on an empty airplane to England. You may, you may think this is crazy, but pretty soon I'm probably going to get a couple of really good cheap flights. Yeah. Amen. I'm just telling you, you, you can't live in fear. I'm going to preach this till we go, guys. You can't, fear paralyzes. It shuts you down. It encloses you in. It's a trick of the devil. Amen. You, can't, you got to live faith by faith. And faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Risk it. Stepping out. Amen. Believe in God for it. The third thing that took place, the third flood, was probably the hardest. It was Judas. They're Judas. John 13, 2 says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray Jesus. You knew there were 12 disciples, and here was the one who had been with Jesus for three years. For he knew, verse 11 tells us, he knew who should betray him, and therefore said that you're not all clean. When Jesus started washing their feet, he said, not all of you guys are clean. But he washed all 12. And I don't have time to go over this whole story. Amen. But all 12 of their feet, he went around 24 feet. 240 toes. Washed all of them. Amen. He faced something he had never experienced before. Rejection from a friend. Now, he had been rejected from religion. He had dealt with the flood of religion. He had dealt with the flood of people that were sick. But never, never had he dealt with this friendship, this betrayal. Literally, the word means to give over, to give up, to help the enemy out. Here we see the Savior forsaking the festival. The festival facing his hour, being betrayed by a friend, yet he still loved these guys. He made us, and he bought us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, And ye are not your own, 
For you bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now you've heard me say this before, church. A couple of weeks ago, I told you that the scripture says in Genesis chapter 2, 7, that God created Adam from the dirt of the ground. And I used a phrase that offended some people because I said, if he made us from dirt, then evidently we're all dirt bags. Amen. Inside, these, inside this dirt, there is a gift. There is a treasure. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's kind of given us hope that all of us are fragile. We're not, we're not supermen like, like, like on the TV shows. It, it, we, we are fragile. But in understanding that, amen, and how that God made us, amen, but later on in life, he redeemed us. He bought us back at the cross. I'm reminded of the little boy that made the little boat. He fashioned a little boat out of wood. He wrote on the side of it, S.S. Minnow. That ought to bring back some memories for some of you. He put the little flag up on it, and he put it in a little creek. He let that little boat go, and that little boat sailed down, and he ran after that little boat, and the boat went into town as the waters gathered up, and he lost his boat. One day, walking through town, a little 12-year-old looked into the window of a pawn shop, and there was his boat. S.S. Minnow, sitting in the, in the pawn shop. He, man, he went in there, and he told that man, that's my boat. And the man said, no, that's my boat. I found that boat. That's my boat. He said, no, that's my boat. I built that boat. S.S. Minnow, look underneath the bottom of that thing. There's two initials on that, J.H. Look at that. That's my boat. And the guy said, no, that's my boat. He said, no, it's mine. He said, I'll, I'll sell it to you. He said, how much? The guy told him how much. He went home, broke his piggy bank to the penny, called out, counted out everything that he had, went back to the, to, to the pawn shop, gave every penny he had to that man, took that little boat, walked outside with that boat, lifted that boat toward heaven and said, I made you and I bought you. Now you're twice mine. My friend, that's you. He made you and he bought you. You are twice his. When you understand redemption and the power of redemption you'll understand that he owns us because he bought us back hallelujah can i get amen what he buys back from from death sin and the grave you say well i don't want to be bought i want death sin and the grave no you don't amen unless you're just dumb blind and stupid okay you can't tell people that way jerry you got to be nicer to folk how's anybody want to go to heaven if you keep telling them dumb stupid and idiots my apology. Every now and then I have a schizophrenic moment. <laughs> Amen. Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm schizophrenic. I am too. Okay. <laughs> Psalm 78, verse 70. He chose David. Yeah, the king. The 15, 16 year old boy that slew Goliath. He chose David. Also, his servant took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes, great with young. He brought him to feed Jacob, his people. In Israel, his inheritance. He, he, he said, David, I'm after you. I choose you. Let me tell you, he chose you. He chose you. So he don't know my, yeah, he knows your name. Amen. You are thought in his mind. He sent you to this earth through a womb to get you here. He chose you. He brought you here for a purpose and a reason. Before the planets found their place, God already chose you. Amen. He can find his own at the workplace, in a fishing boat, casting a net. He can find his own collecting taxes. Amen. Among the poor, behind the desk. He can find his own anywhere. Amen. But I'm telling you something. Forsaken, they are his own. Rejected, they are his. Ridiculed, they are his. God loves us. Love is a verb. It's action. Has so much action connected to it. Amen. John 13, 4 says, he rose from supper. I love this. He didn't just say, I love you. Hey, I love you. Love has to be expressed. Real love. So he, he tells them, I'm never going to forsake you. I love you. Then he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin. And began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. There's something about this man, Jesus. He stood, he rose. I can see him. You, you, you do understand, and I, I've, I've illustrated this before, that they always laid head to foot, head to foot, head to foot. They didn't sit at a table like me and you. They came in and sat head to foot, head to foot, head to foot. You follow that? So there was a circle of 13 guys around the table. Sitting there, one leaning this way, a foot in his face, another one leaning this way, foot in his face. And they didn't wear nice Lucases. They was in sandals. And they walked and they had toe jam all up between their toes. Amen. Dirty, dirty feet. Dirty, hairy feet. Calloused up. 
And there they were around the circle. And the scripture says Jesus got up and got a basin and began to wash their feet. Now, first off, you may think, well, somebody's feet must really stink. But it was an expression of humility and love and servanthood. And he was trying to teach those guys. Guys, you just, I know you think that I, I'm the carpenter, but you see me walk on water. You see me raise the dead. You know I'm the son of God. Amen. I manifested God himself in the flesh. And I, if I can do this for you, you can serve one another. And he taught us how to love, how to care. That no matter what the floods are in our life, amen, through traditions, the floods of, of near death, the floods of dealing with life situations, the floods of betrayal, that no matter what's going on, I can wash your feet. Amen. He stood up. And as he stood, it's a word picture, is a helper, unselfish, thoughtful. He stripped, he uncovered himself, the scripture says. And that doesn't mean all the way down. He just took his outer clothes off. But here's the thing, guys, and the principle. Only those you love or love you can you reveal yourself to. He wouldn't reveal himself to everybody, but in that private moment, in that room, he revealed himself even to a one that would betray him. And oftentimes, betrayal works that way. You reveal yourself to a secret to someone, and they share it. Amen. So here at this moment, the devil had entered into the heart of Judas. Amen. And he began to, the scripture says, to serve them. Your ability, you know, after he stripped it, he began to serve them. Your ability to create unity is directly related to your ability to be a servant. We'll say that again. Your ability to create unity is directly related to your ability to be a servant. Pastor, there's chaos in my house. Serve. There's chaos in our church. Serve. There's chaos in our business. Serve. If you'll start serving. And I love this church. This house, there's something about the little country church, how you serve one another. I watch you pick up one another's plates. I watch you walk by something that's on the ground and you pick it up. I watch you look after the children back there in the back. How you open the door. How you park the cars. How you greet people when they come in. That's servanthood. And the more you serve, the more unity you got. When you get this idea, I want my way, I want to do my thing, then all of a sudden you shut down on everybody else. You are no good to God then, but to serve. And so when he, when he washed the feet of the disciples, and he went by Matthew, the tax collector. Amen. He went by John. You know John was right there going, go ahead, Jesus. Amen. And then when he gets to Peter, Peter backs his feet up and said, you ain't washing my feet? You ain't washing my feet? Now, I believe that reason. There's a reason for that. Because tradition tells us this is Peter's house. And if it's Peter's house, Peter should have been the one washing the feet of everybody that came in. Because that's what the host did. Wash their feet, got them ready to eat. That's what you do. You open the door, you greet them, you love them, you bring them in. Peter didn't do any of that. There's an arrogance sometimes about hanging out with spiritual people. And here Peter, he'd been hanging out with Jesus, you know. Hey, guys, you, you forget I am the one that walked on the water. Yeah, you're also the one that sunk. <laughs> Had to cry out for help. Peter said, you know. Peter said, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus said, unless I'll wash your feet, you don't have a place with me. And Peter actually said, then wash all of me. Wash my head. Wash my body. Wash all of me. Because I love you like that, Jesus. I don't want to miss out with you. He said, wash all of me. And Jesus said, no, only that which comes in contact with the world needs to be washed. Uh-huh. You see, your feet come in contact with the world. I don't have to wash your feet. But this morning, you know what I've been doing? Washing your mind with the word of God. The scripture says in Ephesians, by the washing of the water of the word. Amen. The word washes us. This is what keeps coming in contact with the world. Our mind, our thinking, our stinking thinking, hearing it. So we got to wash it. We got to cleanse it every time we get together. It's a powerful dimension when I look at this. Amen. Nothing changes the atmosphere like serving. You want to break that atmosphere up? Just serve. Do something for somebody and watch and see what happens. Amen. Pick that plate up first. Look after them. Feed them first. Just serve people and watch and see what happens in your life. It's a powerful dimension. He loved them to the end. Now let me close. If Jesus can do all of that and handle the holidays, the traditions, man, traditions, there's so many different ones. If he can handle death, near death experience, right there to the end, he still loved them. He didn't give up on them. The flood couldn't stop it. The, the, the word I heard for the last three years is, you guys went through a flood. You lost your homes. You lost many members in your church. You lost your church for months. 
and your buildings. And yet you still endured Hurricane Harvey and you still love. Then a year later, we get tested again with almost an unheard of storm called Imelda. Because when you ask people in Houston, they have no idea what happened to us out here. But it did it the same amount again. And then we almost want to, and, and Don and other pastors have said to me, why didn't you throw up your hands and walk away? And I, I sat out on our property, and I look at it, and I, this is how I would do this. Listen, I wouldn't be any different if Crosby were flooded. I wouldn't be any different. We would have rushed in here. We would have repaired this building. We would have looked after people on this side of town just like we did the other side. We're the same group of staff, volunteers, and people. And I, I remember as, as that next flood hit, and I, now it, just the other day I'm standing out on the property, H, I'm looking at that, and I'm going, I love this place. I love this place. I know it gets flooded. I know things happen. And I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know how much future we got left. But I know this. As long as God allows us, I want to keep pastoring these churches and keep loving people. Yeah. Amen. Because love, you know what love does? Love covers. Yeah. Amen. It love covers LSU fans. <laughs> love covers a multitude of sins is what I'm really saying here. Hey, what's my last scripture, Cheryl? John 13. A new command I give you. After Jesus did that, he said, Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Well, hold on. By this, this one thing, love. Guys, I know y'all were in the Korean War and Vietnam War because of the hats you wear. And I know you, but I know you wear those proudly. We honor you. I can pick vets out, some by the time, by what they look like. Frank, I can just look at them and tell. That's a vet. And then I look around, and I can tell the cowboys in the house, you know, those who have ridden a long time. They're pretty easy to pick out. I can see the bikers. I can pick a biker up like that. I can tell bikers, you know, because they... Anytime you get off your Harley, you're like this. You can, you can pick out people by different things. I can look at religions. I can go into a restaurant and tell you those, those are United Pentecostal church people. Sleeves down to here, hair down to here, no makeup. <laughs> Amen. They got the dresses down to here. Bless their heart. The women, they don't let them help themselves. And the men show up, hair dressed back, fancy suits on. Every now and then a Baptist blends in with them. Jesus gave us one distinctive mark that you will know that all of these people, red, yellow, black, white, north, south, east, west, you'll know they are my brothers and my sisters if they have love one to another. What distinguishes us from Muslims, Buddhists, atheists? And I'm not picking here. I'm just telling you. What distinguishes us is that we have love one to another. Amen. We come from different cultures, different backgrounds, different states. And we got to love one for each other. And when you, Jesus said, when you can love one another, that's why I've always struggled with this. Why do people hate Jews so much? Because Jesus was a Jew that taught us to love one another. I'm a German. I, you know, they should hate me. Because I was raised up, I mean, my, as far as I know, that's my ancestry. But I never knew I was German. I always thought we were just bootleggers. <laughs> but, but love, love. If you love one another, and if this church starts loving other churches and starts loving other people that are unlovable, you're going to see folk come flooding in here toward because they just look for a place to be loved. You know, why, why do you go down to that bar? Because they hate me so much. No, you go there because somebody in the bar loves you. Why do you go? They, everywhere we go is about love. Every place we, we want to connect with people that love us. Amen. And if you come to this house and you're not loved and you don't show love, then you don't know Jesus. That's right. It's that simple. You're so full of hatred. Look, you're not. You, you're not going to heaven. 
Jesus made it plain. We got to love one another. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Love so much deeper than just an emotion. It's a decision. And whether I feel it or not, I'm going to love you. Jesus said, I came to show you the Father. This is who he really is. For God, my Father, so loved the world that he sent me his only Son. That whosoever believes in him would not perish, but be able to have everlasting life. It all started because God is love. Love is the greatest of hope and faith. If I have love, and if I do not love, if I do not give my, you know, if I give my body to be burned and have not love, what did it accomplish me? If I give all I have and have not love, what did it accomplish me? Amen. We need to love one another. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and if you don't know Jesus and the love of God, for the love of God, put your hand up right now. Let me pray for you. Amen. For the love of God, let me pray for you. Just up and down. Let me see that hand again. Amen. So I can pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. Let's pray this together. Thank you, sir. I'm asking God to fill you with love. How do you know you've been born again? Because you start loving the unlovable. Let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, fill me with love. Forgive me of my sins. Wash over me. Cleanse me from hatred, hurt of the past. God, in Jesus' name. I receive you and I give you thanks ahead of time for this big heart that I'm going to have and it will be manifested by serving one another in Jesus name. Amen. Now come on, give God a radical praise. Amen. If you're watching online, those that are watching online, the same love of God that's in this house is coming into your home right now. No matter if you're watching on smartphone, TV, amen, or watching on a computer, I'm praying that God will touch you right in your home. If we start loving again, if we start caring, if we start being the church that God wants us to be, we'll love and reach the unlovable, and their lives will be turned around. I never saw it more evident than at that funeral yesterday. Patsy, as I saw all those folk that Kelly had touched and this church had touched, so important. I love this church. I love you. Amen. If I get our servant leaders to come up.